Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, hello to everybody and members of planning committee and everyone listening in today. My name is David Riley from SGL Planning and Design, um, and uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be here today. I'm joining you from a property on Bird Lake in neighboring Bracebridge. So I'm not quite in Huntsville, but I'm, I'm close. <laughs> I'm, I'm close. I asked Richard and Kirsten before this meeting if there was a chance we could meet in person, but I guess we're, not, we're all not there yet. So I, I'm, I'm coming closer to you guys. So we'll be there soon. Um, if, if I could ask uh, Richard to please uh, share the presentation, that would be great. Thank you. Excellent. And uh, Richard, if you could move to the next slide, please. And I just wanted to introduce to you, um, obviously I'm David Riley, but also uh, from SGL, uh, not here today is Paul Lowe's. And then uh, importantly, also on the consulting team is Dylan Consulting. Uh, and we've got Justine, Annie, and Daniel, and uh, some of you may be familiar with them um, in, in some of the public consultation or stakeholder consultation work that we've done, and we'll continue to do. So I just wanted to remind everyone that we're, I'm part of a broader team. Uh, next slide, please, Richard. And where we're at in the process here is um, we've we've gone through phases one to three, and we're in phase four, uh, which is the actual bylaw preparation. So, as mentioned, this is the first draft of the bylaw that's released for public comment. And um, after this, uh, I'll we'll, we'll be um, having more public consultation, more stakeholder consultation, coming back with a second draft of the bylaw, having more consultation on that, and then preparing the final. Uh, for approval. Uh, so there's definitely lots of chances to be heard and, and we definitely want that uh, feedback. Uh, so next slide, please. Oh, there it is animating that slide. Perfect. Uh, so uh, just quickly, I wanted to just over provide a, a quick refresher and overview of the key benefits of a community planning permit system. So generally, um, it combines zoning, site plan, minor variants into one application and approval process. We can have shorter approval timelines within 45 days. It allows a municipality to impose certain conditions of development that benefit the community. And also it adds predictability to the process for the community as well as landowners and developers, and uh, generally a more stable planning vision for their municipality with no third party appeals. Next slide, please. So this is table one on page five of the draft bylaw. And I, I won't read this in detail during this presentation, but I, we just wanted to highlight that it, this is an important table um, as it provides really a succinct overview of what a community planning permit system is. And I'll be going uh, through all of these items during the presentation. But one thing that I did wanna highlight off the bat um, is the term precinct. So the term precinct is what we're using to describe the areas that we would refer to as zones within the existing zoning bylaw. So within our community planning permit bylaw, we're calling those precincts. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a visual that uh, planning committee and the, the public uh, may be familiar with already as we had included it in our background and directions report. Um, but th this uh, really, it, it's also in the bylaw itself, but it provides a simplified view of how the community planning permit bylaw combines multiple steps into one process as compared to the status quo process in place today. So if you look at the top, um, of this, the top half under traditional process, this is the status quo. And you see kind of a colored box around zoning bylaw, minor variance, site alteration permit, site plan application, and tree removal permit. Basically all of those things get combined into one process of community planning permit um, within the CPP process. So this is just a simplified view of, of how um, we think things are streamlined and uh, simplified through this new process. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as I mentioned, um, we started with the background review um, 
And then we, uh, you know, that included a review of best practices, official plan, zoning bylaw. We reviewed minor variants and zoning, previous zoning applications. We developed a key, uh, key directions for Huntsville. And this is our background um, and directions report. And now we're here we are, the, the first draft of the CPP bylaw. And so I'd like to start taking you th through the various sections of the bylaw, and I will be um, brief as possible. So if you could go to the next slide, please, Richard. Um, starting with section one, explanatory notes and context. This is really setting out the basis for the CPP bylaw, and it provides an overview of the community planning permit system. And what we've added is a section called how to read this bylaw. So this includes a summary of each section of the bylaw, but also um, we, we think adds to the readability and implementation and interpretation of the bylaw. We, we've included a step-by-step -step guide for users on how to interpret and read the bylaw. Uh, next slide, please. So here we are, uh, section two, which is the administration section of the bylaw. So this section sets out the structure and the administrative procedures of the bylaw, such as when a CPP, so when I say CPP, that's community planning permit, when a CPP permit is required, um, it establishes the classes of the planning permits and the process for considering variations to the provisions. It also sets out a process for provisional approvals and it sets out what's exempted from a community planning permit. Um, so we're gonna dive in, to, dive in a little bit deeper into all of these matters now. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please, Richard. Um, so first, um, let's talk about the, the classes. And um, these will make a little bit more sense as, as we go through, but generally there's three permit classes. So a class one permit, is when all development standards are met. So if you're coming in for a, a new dwelling on a property and you meet all of the law requirements, minimum lot size, uh, lot coverage, setbacks, height, et cetera, you can uh, move forward um, without um, uh, kind of a, a, a bit of a longer process um, and the approval is delegated to staff. A class two, permit is when you need variations to some of those bylaw requirements or if vegetation removal is proposed. Um, and the variations are only up to a certain threshold of variation and I'll explain that in a little bit. But again, a class two permit is also approved by staff. And a class three uh, permit is, a, is when council variations are required. Um, so these are more than what we would consider minor variations to the bylaw. And in this case, approval by council is required. So now we'll get into a little bit more about variations and what does this mean exactly? So uh, next slide, please. So we've got class two and class three, class three variations. Um, and the bylaw establishes the threshold for what would be considered a class two or a class three variation. So, for example, if you're looking at the lot requirement standards for a specific precinct, uh, so residential urban shoreline precinct, for example, and you were proposing a reduction in the minimum required side yard setback, the table in the bylaw itself establishes a maximum threshold for a reduction for a class two variation to that side yard setback, for example, a 20% reduction. So if the side yard setback was re being reduced by less than 20%, that would be a class two variation. But if it was being reduced by more than 20% of the standard, that would be a class three variation, which would be a council variation. Um, so importantly, the bylaw also establishes criteria for considering variations. So how do we assess whether this variation is appropriate? So the bylaw actually includes that criteria within it. Um, so this will be uh, important to evaluate all permit applications and really we think is a useful tool for all decision makers. So planning committee, staff, um, anyone really using the bylaw. Uh, next slide, please. And um, in terms of this criteria, here's a couple examples of, of some of those criteria uh, for considering variations. Um, including that the proposal is appropriate for the lands, takes into account the unique characteristics of the property and is compatible with surrounding land uses, 
uh, or that the proposal is consistent with the provisions of the bylaw and applicable policy documents, such as the town's official plan, um, as well as the proposal creates no adverse impacts um, or demonstrates measures to avoid uh, or mitigate the adverse impact. So um, for, for instance, if you were proposing um, a, a reduced side yard, for example, well, maybe one of the ways to mitigate that is to provide for appropriate landscaping to, to have that appropriate interface between two properties, just as an example. Uh, next slide, please. And so section uh, 2.12 of the bylaw includes really a step-by-step -step process for uh, planning permits by class. Um, and I'll just kind of zoom into each section here. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Step one is really the pre-consultation stage of the process. So pre-consultation meeting happens with town staff and other relevant review agencies. So this could be MTO, it could be the district. Um, at this, or after this meeting, a checklist is prepared listing all of the submission requirements that would be that would form part of a complete application and staff also determine which permit class is applicable based on the proposal so the applicant would know in step one is this a class one two or three permit so now in step two on the next slide um, this is the application submission so starting with the submission of the application where the applicant submits all of the required plans and studies as identified on the checklist. The application is then circulated to the agencies and departments for comment. And once all the comments are received and comments that the required and confirmation that the checklist items have all been submitted, then the application is deemed complete. So all comments are received, then we have a complete application. For class one, there's no notification required since there's really no variations to bylaw standards. For class two and three, notification is required. So for class two, staff will prepare the notice posted on the town's website and the applicant will post a sign on the property and any concerned individuals can submit comments within 15 days. In class three, the same notification process as class two is followed with the added requirement to notify all property owners within 120 meters of the subject property by mail. So what we've tried to do here is, um, given that there's no uh, third party appeal, so only the applicant can appeal a decision, we really do want to make sure that people have the opportunity to comment on uh, community planning permit applications similar to what they can do today. Um, so this is really setting up that process. Uh, the next slide, we're in step three. Uh, this is the application review stage. So for class one, if there's no significant issues raised, then the application can be pro proceed to a decision. And if there's no concerns, um, or, or sorry, if there are concerns, then these can be discussed with the applicant and any revisions can be made. Um, in class two, if there's no significant issues raised, then the application also can proceed to a decision. And again, this is a town staff decision. Um, and if there are significant issues, there is an option to bump up the application to a class three council variation. And this bump up can, occur, can happen by staff or by council. Uh, for class three, the application is forwarded to council for a decision. Again, and, and of course, starting with a presentation to a planning committee. And then step four, the decision itself on the next slide, um, we're either looking at a decision that's approved, provisionally approved, or refused. And I'll explain provisional approvals a little bit um, in, in the, on the next slide. But if approved, um, there might be a requirement for an agreement to be registered on title, similar to any site plan agreement that you might be familiar with now, as well as a building permit. A building permit won't always be required, but it may be um, with some applications. So if refused, then the applicant may appeal the decision to the Ontario Land Tribunal. And if provisionally approved, this means that the applicant will need to fulfill certain conditions prior to final approval. And, and now let's talk a little bit about what that means. Next slide, please. So provisional approvals, um, what this is, is uh, really the bylaw is setting out a process by which um, an, a, an application can be approved 
based on certain conditions. Um, so it's subject to certain conditions of approval being met within one year of the provisional approval being granted. So for example, staff may grant provisional approval for a permit application, um, say it was um, a, a deck on the side of a commercial operation for the purposes of a patio, <laughs> for example. And um, uh, they may grant provisional approval subject to the submission of a landscape plan or another study or a plan that uh, is deemed satisfactory to the to town staff. Um, and section 212.6 of the bylaw lists a number of potential conditions that the town may impose through provisional approval. So it's not limited to, the, to those, but we wanted to give people an understanding of what some of these conditions would be. Um, next slide, please, Richard. Um, so the CPP bylaw also sets out certain types of development that do not require a community planning permit. So uh, this would include interior renovations, provided that there's no change in use, of course, uh, minor repairs, maintenance, and replacement on properties, uh, vegetation removal in some cases. So if it's associated with forestry operations or uh, vegetation removal is uh, proposed in a rural precinct outside of natural heritage features, et cetera. That does not require a community planning permit. Uh, seasonal water structures, agricultural uses and buildings in the rural precinct, as long as minimum distance separation is met, as well as single detached dwellings located outside of the waterfront precincts. Um, so uh, it's this is just a, an example of some of the things that are exempt that I wanted to highlight. Uh, next slide, please. And so now that wraps up section two and section three is the definition section. Um, and, and generally we've carried forward the definitions from the existing zoning bylaw, but we have made some additions and clarifications where appropriate, um, such as new definitions for natural features within the town's natural heritage system. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure that we had consistent definitions between the official plan and the community planning permit bylaw. Uh, we've also updated various dwelling definitions. So uh, we've added a, another type of townhouse, which is a block townhouse. So this would be um, a condominium development, not a common element condominium development, but where um, a, a homeowner would own the unit itself within all of the land would be owned by the condominium. Um, so this is just another example of um, built form that we do see examples in Huntsville and we want to reflect that in the bylaw. Um, we've also um, clarified and improved certain definitions, for example, floor area and just uh, wanted to provide clarification as it relates to some other uses that it may not have been clear. Uh, next slide, please. So now we're into section four, the general provisions. <laughs> And section four contains um, general provisions that are applicable to all precincts within Huntsville. And, and they address matters such as setbacks from water courses or regulations for specific uses uh, that are permitted within many precincts and uh, regulations related to vegetation removal and site, site alteration uh, among many other matters. And generally we've carried forward the provisions from the existing zoning bylaw where we could and we have updated and simplified provisions where appropriate. So you, you've heard me say that a few times, we really wanted to use the bylaw as a basis. This is what people know, this is what works in Huntsville. It was a, it's a great base bylaw, but of course we've, we're needing to make changes to it and altering it to be this new process, community planning permit process. So you will see a lot of the things that you do see in the existing zoning bylaw carried forward. Um, but I, I did want to highlight a few other new things that have been included within this section uh, on general provisions. So um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, first of all, you can also vary a general provision. Um, so what we've said was that unless otherwise noted, so sometimes in the general provision to say this is a class three variation, um, but unless otherwise noted, variations to any general provision within section four would be a class two community planning permit application. Um, so staff approval. Um, discretionary uses. So um, the bylaw, this is something new, um, and the bylaw sets out certain uses that may be permitted subject to applicable criteria. 
So if, uh, if you're looking at the permitted uses tables in section six of the bylaw, you'll see another column now that says whether it's discretionary or not. So if it's discretionary, it's to the town's discretion of whether it should be permitted or not. And the, the, the bylaw directs town staff to look at that um, in the context of other um, sections of the bylaw. Um, and that's the section on conditions, provisional approvals, and uh, criteria for considering variations. So um, it's really just a way to say, yes, we may want to have a bed and breakfast establishment in this uh, precinct. However, we just need to think about it for and consider these things. And yes, it may be permitted. Um, so uh, that's what discretionary uses is. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so there's a new section, um, which was not in the uh, current zoning bylaw, and this is on vegetation removal and site alteration. So uh, a CPP permit would be required for vegetation removal within 30 meters of any shoreline within an urban shoreline or waterfront designation, um, or vegetation removal within woodlands that are uh, greater than 0.5 hectares in size, and within or adjacent to the natural heritage system. Um, so the provisions of the section don't apply, as I mentioned when I was talking about exemptions, to forestry operations, licensed, licensed aggregate operations, or approved public works. Um, and also the removal of vegetation where it's not defined as a tree doesn't require a permit. And we've added a definition for tree in the bylaw to clarify what, what that would be. Um, and so conditions may be added to a community planning permit to minimize the extent of site grading and alteration. Um, and this could include requirements for stormwater management or restricting site alteration in areas of steep slopes, um, et cetera. Next slide, please. We've also included some new provisions for secondary residential dwelling units uh, within separate detached accessory buildings. And this is really looking at um, within the urban areas, uh, we wanted to provide a little bit more regulation um, in terms of what these could look like. Um, and so uh, we've specified you can be eight meters, a uh, uh, maximum gross floor area of 75 square meters, eight meters within the rural precinct, but six meters if you're within another precinct, because we, you know, we want to make sure that heights are compatible. Um, minimum setbacks, you want to make sure that you have that minimum setback from side and rear lot lines to provide for adequate separation distance, but also amenity space for the uh, re secondary residential dwelling unit if it's within a detached structure. Um, and also making sure that there's enough space between the accessory structure and the main dwelling on the property. We've uh, suggested 5.5 meters, um, which would allow for that separation, but also amenity space related to the, uh, for the main dwelling. Uh, next slide, please. We're moving on to section five and um, section five is really carrying over many of the parking and loading requirements uh, that apply uh, to, within the existing zoning now. And so they'll apply to all precincts in Huntsville, um, uh, including minimum number of parking and loading spaces, as well as minimum dimensions, um, and things like that. Um, so largely carried over from the existing bylaw with some updates. An example of one update we did was um, requiring for parking lots that have more than 20 parking spaces, just making sure that there's enough space for an entrance and exit within those driveway openings. Um, we've heard that there's some examples where um, there's sometimes conflict between cars entering and exiting some parking lots. So this is just an example of uh, one of the changes that we've made. And now we're moving on to where a lot of the um, details are within the uh, 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 bylaw. And this is section six, which contains really all of the detail with respect to permitted uses and lot standards for the various precincts. So um, starting with the existing zones as a base, we've really, um, and, and uh, we've touched on this in the last presentation um, we did to planning committee, uh, but we've really simplified the number of zones to create fewer precincts. Um, and these precincts are in conformity with the official plan land use designations. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so on these next two slides that you'll see, uh, you'll see two columns. 
with the new precinct on the left hand side and the various zones that have been incorporated within each precinct on the right hand side. Um, so there was some overlap between which zones would be incorporated into which precincts and um, this is where we, we really tried to line things up with the OP designation. So you can see here, for example, in the residential precincts, C1 and R1 appear within many of these. Well, that's because that zone actually applied within all of these various areas. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we took some of the provisions from those zones, but applied them appropriately to the precincts. Um, so the C1 zone, for example, is the uh, convenience commercial um, and uh, that's permitted if you're looking at the um, at the official plan within residential land use designation. So we wanted to incorporate that permission within the residential precincts. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here we have uh, commercial precincts. So we've got one commercial precinct, regional commercial, um, and the former zones there. We've really, for mixed use precincts, we've really tried to simplify things and um, wanted to um, combine the, ur the urban mixed use uh, former zones into one precinct while still recognizing the central business district as a separate precinct. So we have done that uh, because there is really a different uh, character and zone standard or uh, precinct standards that, that would apply there. And also community mixed use for uh, the community settlement areas. Um, was really that's just showing up in uh, Port Sydney. Uh, next slide, please. And then with the employment precincts, um, we, we still wanted to distinguish between urban business employment and community business employment, community again referring to Port Sydney, um, and um, still keeping that heavy employment um, separate uh, precinct. Um, open space, combine the open space zones, um, but still keeping institutional separate from that. Next slide, please. And then rural, um, having, um, you know, uh, rural residential, rural extractive, um, and Hidden Valley, uh, two precincts, so recreational resort residential and resort commercial. Next slide, please. And then still having what's the existing conservation zone um, is the conservation um, precinct, um, but then there's also uh, an uh, overlay uh, that I need to discuss. So overlays are, are showing up on all the land use schedule or on all of the uh, CPP bylaw schedules. And we've got the natural constraints overlay and then various flood zone or overlays. Um, this is based on existing mapping um, and it is also reflected within the official plan. But really the natural constraints overlay is a way for us to recognize that with uh, within in the official plan, all of these features have been identified. We wanted to carry those over into the CPP bylaw so that underlying you might be rural or urban shoreline residential, but you may have an overlay of a natural constraint or a flood zone overlay. And what this will do is it'll trigger um, separate provisions that would also apply in addition to those underlying precinct categories. So it's a way to make sure that we are capturing within the CPP bylaw all of those important natural constraints and flood um, overlays that, that do exist. Um, next slide, please. So really, when you're looking at each precinct within the, the bylaw, uh, you have permitted uses, permitted accessory uses, and lot requirements. And also, you'll have discretionary uses and the uh, class two variation limits that are specified within the table. So let's just look at how this shows up in section six. Um, so you can see here, for example, here's a snapshot of permitted uses within the residential precincts. So you can see on the right hand side, those uses identified as discretionary, those would be evaluated as permitted uses by staff in accordance with the criteria of the bylaw. So you can see financial establishment and food store Yes, they're permitted in um, some of the urban um, residential designations and community residential, but discretionary. So it might be based on location in relation to where it might be appropriate. So not necessarily in the middle of uh, maybe uh, a bunch of uh, single 
residential dwellings, but maybe closer to where there might be existing commercial uses, something like that. Next slide, please. Um, here's a snapshot of accessory uses that are permitted within the residential pre precinct. So pretty self-explanatory and similar to how you're, it's what's structured in the bylaw today. Next slide, please. And this is showing for lot requirements. So these are presented in a table format. So um, you can see here minimum lot frontage, lot coverage, et cetera. And you can see on the right hand side, there's information about class two variation limits. So for example, if an application was proposing to increase the maximum lot coverage within the regional commercial precinct, a variation of up to 20% from the bylaw requirement would be considered a class two variation which is a staff approval, but anything beyond that would be a class three variation considering uh, which would require council approval. So that's really how the class two variation limits are working. Uh, next slide, please. Just wanted to show what some of the schedules look like here. Um, and this was a real collaborative effort between uh, the consulting team and town staff to prepare these uh, these schedules, but we really wanted to prepare a comprehensive set of schedules that were organized in a, a grid system. Um, so these these um, these are really going to be something that you can print and know exactly where it is and what schedule your property is on. Um, you can see that the, the grid in kind of the top right of each page and it, uh, an example of uh, what grid the where it's highlighted um, on on that on that sheet on the top right, this is the grid that we're looking at and it shows all the properties within that area. So that key map shows up on all schedules and it shows um, all the precincts. And you can see in these examples, some, some of those overlays that, that we were talking about in terms of natural constraints. Um, next slide, please. And I, 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 I don't, I think at this point I'll go through this scenario, but if anyone wanted to refer back to this presentation um, in more detail, this is just a little bit of a scenario that shows a comparison at the top of what the current system is in terms of having to uh, deal with separate zoning by maybe site plan applications or a minor variance application compared to the new CPP system um, on the bottom line. Um, so just a, an example of what a simplified uh, process looks like in the case of John here, who would want to expand his commercial business. Uh, next slide, please. And, and just wanted to, to uh, finalize the presentation by just kind of showing what the next steps are. And of course, we were excited that um, and, and hoping that the bylaw will be released to uh, uh, the public for comment um, so we can continue on with our work plan, which includes stakeholder meetings, a public open house, a public meeting, um, and then further revisions to the bylaw, um, followed by another public meeting, and then preparing the final bylaw before approval. So um, next slide. I'm uh, happy to have had a chance to uh, provide this presentation to you today. I know that was a lot to cover, and I appreciate the, um, the extra time that you, you gave to me today. Um, but I, I, I did think it was important to take everyone through in a little bit of detail the new bylaw is it's it's a lot to digest um, but we uh, we're pretty happy with it and and we're pretty um, um, excited to hear the the feedback and ideas and comments that everyone has so um thank you very much <laughs>